I am so thankful to be here with you guys this morning. Thank you for coming and joining us in this space. Again, we've mentioned we know it's different, but I believe that God is moving right here, right now. And he's moving over there. It's so exciting. We get to double up today. It's, it's awesome. If you notice, and I hope you don't, because we vacuumed so, we tried so hard to vacuum in here really, really well. But if you notice some little, like, orange specks, just know, and I, I'm, I feel like I'm bringing a little bit, just know that um, yesterday, while our teenagers were in here, they, uh, they packed several of these. And what these are is they are meals that go to people who need them. And each one feeds a family of four, and they packed 10,000 of them? No. If I'm right. Well, I heard it was 40,000 meals. 40,000 of those. 40,000 of these? Okay, well, either way, a lot. They packed a lot of these. They were in here for hours and hours packing these. Um, they had a really cool assembly line thing going, and these are going to go out to people that need them, and your young people were a part of making that happen. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure to mention that to you this morning, because I thought it was really cool. And if you see any orange specks, just know that's what they're from, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, or rice. Lots of rice is in here. Well, this week, you guys, we are going to continue in our gratitude series. And last week, Pastor Jeanette, she spoke to us. She kicked off the series with Matthew chapter 26, was kind of the verse that, uh, that we were living in last week. She referenced uh, Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples, if you were here. If you weren't, it's okay. We'll catch you up to speed. But uh, that's, that's where we lived last week, and she shared with us an example of a moment in Matthew 26, where Jesus really pushes his disciples to be thankful and to express gratitude and remembrance. Today, we are going to look at another story and another gospel where Jesus pushes someone else towards gratitude and where true intentional gratitude is expressed. Now, before we do that, I wanted to make sure that we did something in here. Now, our series is called Intentional Gratitude, and I wanted to talk for a minute about what we mean when we say that. Because those are two words that we just kind of, you know, put together, but they have a meaning. And so I wanted to talk about the word gratitude very briefly. The word gratitude is probably one that most of us in here are like, yeah, we, we, have, we think of something when we hear gratitude. We think of thankfulness, right? If you're a kid in here, can you do me a favor? Because normally we're in here without the adults. But today the adults are with us. Is that okay? Yeah? If you're a kid in here, can you do me a favor and say the word thankful as loud as you can? Thank, thank, thank Good job. You. Let's try it again. One, two, three. Thank you. Nice. Good job. I love it. So when we talk about the word gratitude, what we're talking about is an expression of thankfulness. See, thankfulness is kind of inward, isn't it? It's something that we feel. It's something we might think, like, oh, I'm thankful for this or that. But gratitude takes thankfulness a step further. And it goes, I'm thankful, and so I'm going to do something about it. I'm thankful, and so I have an expression of thankfulness. That's what gratitude means. That's what we're talking about today. But then we have this word intentional. This word intentional. Intentional means something's on purpose, right? It means that something is thought through. Uh, something is considered. It's, we took some time to really think about um, what we were doing, and then we did it. It's intentional. And I would challenge us today to think about this word intention, intentional um, as something that has an end goal. So when we do something that's intentional, we are doing something with a goal in mind. For example, I might choose to... Um, even though I'm disappointed, I might choose to express thankfulness because I'm being intentional, because I want to be a person who lives in content. I want to be a person who's content. And so even when I'm disappointed, I'm going to be intentional to express gratitude. So it has an end goal in mind. So intentional gratitude is a thought through purposeful 
expression, an expression of gratitude. Intentional gratitude is the choice we make. And that, that word choice takes it a, a little bit further, doesn't it? Because the thing about intentional gratitude is it doesn't just happen, we have to choose it. We have to choose it. It's the choice we make to purposefully express thankfulness. So I would, I would say today that what sets intentional gratitude aside from just gratitude is that gratitude says thank you for what I've received. Gratitude says thank you for what I've received, right? But intentional gratitude has the power to say this, thank you, Lord, for the blessings that I haven't received yet. Thank you, Lord, for the things that I haven't received and I can't even imagine yet. Thank you, Lord, for what's ahead that I don't understand. You see the difference? So intentional gratitude um, might mean that we're thankful for the things that we don't even know if they're going to happen or not. Have you ever been there? Lord, I'm trying to be thankful, but I don't even know if this is going to work out the way I thought it would. That's hard to do, isn't it? That's a choice. Intentional gratitude can mean that we are thankful for the healing that we haven't experienced yet. Have you guys ever been there? Lord, I'm choosing to be thankful, but I'm still hurting. That's hard to do, isn't it? That's intentional gratitude. It might mean that we say, Lord, thank you. Um, I am choosing gratitude for that relationship that is yet to be mended. I'm choosing gratitude even though they won't speak to me still. I'm choosing gratitude even though they haven't come home. I'm choosing to be intentional with my gratitude, even though I haven't seen it. You know, um, when you guys walked in, we, uh, we moved our testimonies to the hallway. Me and Missy tried really hard to make them straight. I, we had a level of everything out, okay? So if they're crooked, don't tell me. <laughs> Just pretend. <laughs> but we moved those to the hallway because we thought it was important that you guys see them, even if it was just for one more week. Because those testimonies are valuable. They are a reminder of the ways that God has shown up for, for all of you. And I love reading them. Sometimes I get emotional just reading them because they are representations of what God has done in our lives. But as I was thinking about them today and I was thinking about this series, I was thinking, God, intentional gratitude would look like holding that testimony card in your hand and not being sure what to write on it and still being grateful. So guys, when you hear the word intentional gratitude, I don't want you to think, oh yeah, that means I said thank you and no one had to tell me. That's hard kids, right? When you see those words, I want you to think, this is actually something that every one of us in here has probably struggled to live and to do. Because it's not easy. But it's what Jesus calls us to. So today, I want us to really live in the book of John together in the Bible. There's four Gospels. There's Matthew, there's Mark, there's Luke, and there's John. Now, when I first became a Christian, I didn't know that those were all about Jesus' ministry, and they were all, you know, eyewitness testimonies of what, you know, Jesus' life. I didn't know. So somebody from my church at the time, they said, if you want to start reading your Bible, start in the Gospels. Start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So I did, and I remember starting to read and thinking, the Bible sounds the same. Every single book. <laughs> what is this? Eventually I realized that the Gospels are four different people who are sharing their account of Jesus' life. Okay? And so when we read the Gospel of John, it's his account of what he experienced with Jesus and the things that he thought were valuable for you to know. Now the book of John is a little bit different than all the other Gospels. It, um, it is not chronological. It's not in order. And when I was reading through it this week, I had to remember that. I had to remember that the Gospel of John is not necessarily in order, but it does have, it does have a layout to it. And I wanted to share that with you guys today, okay, just to help us kind of understand where we're coming from. So the book of John looks something like this. There are, um, there are 21 chapters. And the first 11 chapters, they share with us Jesus' ministry. So they share with us things like the calling of the disciples. They share with us his teachings, him, him preaching, him walking with his disciples together. 
They share with us his miracles and the things that, um, the miraculous signs that he performed when, when he was walking with his disciples. They really share the heart of the ministry of Jesus, chapters 1 through 11. But they also share something really, uh, really special with us. Okay, the book of John has seven miraculous signs. It has seven of them that John includes. Now, we hear at the end of the book, he lets us know that there are far more than seven, right? But if we were to record all of them, we could keep recording and keep recording and keep recording forever. But John includes seven of them. The first one is when Jesus turns water into wine. We read that in John chapter 2. That's the first miraculous sign. The last one is in chapter 11. And that's why, we've, and that's why uh, chapter 1 through 11 is that first section. It has all seven signs in it. And the last one we're going to talk about a little bit today is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. It's a pretty big one, isn't it? That's a pretty big one. So chapters 1 through 11 are that, and then if I can skip just a minute into chapter 13, I'm doing this intentionally, chapter 13 through chapter um, 21 look a little bit different. And all of these chapters, they no longer include the kind of ministry where Jesus is freely moving about and, and with his disciples and performing miracles, but actually these chapters really cover um, the moments before his arrest where he's preparing his disciples for what life looks like without him physically present. Uh, it includes his arrest, his death, his resurrection from the grave, and those brief moments before he ascends to heaven. So as you can see, that first half and that second half, if you will, they look a lot different, don't they? They look a lot different. The first part of John is really Jesus um, walking with his disciples and living with them and teaching them and loving them. The second half is Jesus saying, here's what you need to know because I'm about to go somewhere else. He's preparing them for something new, something that they can't see yet, they don't understand yet, but Jesus tells them to be grateful for it. And right there in the middle of of both of those sections, if you will, there's this one chapter, chapter 12. There's this one chapter, and that is where we are really going to focus today, because there is a beautiful story there about a woman named Mary who does something pretty special for Jesus, who does something really, really special for Jesus. But before we do that, I wanted to give you just a little bit of background uh, for Mary, because she actually is related to Lazarus, who I mentioned was the raising of Lazarus is that last sign that we see in John chapter 11. And um, Mary is, I almost said Mary is his brother. That is not correct. Mary is his sister. Guys, I've been with these teenagers all week, so if I say something that doesn't make sense, it's because I've had little sleep and lots of pizza. Okay? That's all I got to say. But in John, in, uh, in John chapter 11, we see Lazarus' story. And Lazarus' story is valuable because, um, well, it's a, it's a really powerful story, first of all, but also because I want you to hear this this morning because, again, he's related to Mary, who we're going to focus on here in just a minute. So Lazarus is someone who, um, he becomes sick. He becomes sick. And the, um, I'm sorry, Mary and Martha, they send word to Jesus because Jesus actually has spent time with them before and they were hoping that if he would come to where Lazarus was, that Lazarus would be better. They send word to him. They call out to him or, you know, and, um, and Lazarus is not well. He's not well. So Jesus hears of this. He loves these people. Actually, Lazarus, like John, really, is, is called um, someone who Jesus loves. Someone who Jesus loves. Now, you might say, well, that's everybody. Jesus loves everybody. But um, if you read in John chapter 11, it's actually made note that Lazarus was someone who Jesus loved. I think that's, man, if I'm going to be known by anything, if I'm going to be called anything, let it be that, right? So Lazarus isn't well. Um, they ask Jesus to come, but and Jesus does. He 
He does come to where Lazarus is at, but by the time he gets there, Lazarus has already died. Lazarus has already passed away. And of course, Mary and Martha are devastated. This is their brother, right? And there's a little bit of, oh goodness, there's a little bit of feeling, Jesus, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. But Mary and Martha also know, and they express to Jesus, but I know that you can, you can do anything, but you're the giver of life. And so the story continues, and um, Jesus, he asks Mary uh, and Martha to lead them to where Lazarus is, and they do. And I can imagine at this point that they're wondering what he's up to. But they're listening to him. They're saying, Jesus, you know, we're, we're just going to do what you say. We're going to go with you. We're going to show him where he's at. We trust you. So they do. They go to the grave where Lazarus has been buried. And now they warn Jesus. They say, he has been in here for like four days. So if we open this thing, I mean, it's going to stink. <laughs> they're just really honest with him. They're like, I don't know if we want to do this. But Jesus says, no, roll away the stone. He understands that he has something planned. And so they do what he's asked. And Jesus calls out to Lazarus to, to rise. And Lazarus does. He does. That blows my mind. That at the voice of Jesus, this man who was literally dead came to life. Now imagine being there. Imagine being there. That's your brother. Imagine the thankfulness. Just thankfulness that doesn't make sense that exists in your heart. There's a couple things that I want us to know before we move on. Because we're going to talk about Mary's thankfulness today. But I wanted to note some things for us before we keep going. Because there's some things about Lazarus' story that I think are really valuable. I mean, there's, gosh, there's a lot. I'm going to just tell you a little. The first thing is this. When Jesus decides to go to where Lazarus, it, Lazarus is, his disciples tell him something. They basically remind him that going to where Lazarus is is a death sentence. That traveling through Bethany, which is where they were, which is where Lazarus was, was a death sentence. Now why? Right? Why? That sounds pretty intense. Are the people in Bethany just like that? I don't No. Bethany is two miles away, roughly, from Jerusalem. Where, now we're getting, remember, remember the way that John is laid out? We're in chapter 11. So where are we about, what are we about to move into? Jesus' arrest, his death, Right? So as you can imagine, the tension has been building, right? And we're to chapter 11. And the people, the Jews in Jerusalem, are not very happy with Jesus. The tension is growing. They are more and more, um, there are some who are actually coming to him. But there are, are others who want nothing to do with him and actually despise him. And that tension is building. We're all the way to chapter 11. And so the disciples remind him that if he goes there, there are probably people who are going to arrest him. There are probably people who have very bad intentions for him. But here's the thing. Jesus was willing to walk into a place filled with people who he knew despised him and would eventually kill him. Jesus knows this. And he still goes. He still goes. And so the one thing that I want us to note about Lazarus' story for the sake of today is that um, Jesus set aside his own life as a pure act of love for his friend Lazarus. He set aside his own life because he knew that by going to Bethany, that essentially would be the end of, his, of that chapter of his ministry. He knew that by going there, there would be people who were ready to kill him right there. And he went anyway. And so I think that this, this miraculous sign is especially valuable to us this morning because if you hear nothing else, I want you to hear this. Jesus has conquered death so that you can have life. Lazarus is a picture of that for us. But I want you to understand that we, uh, when we are living in death, 
Jesus comes to where we are to give us life. And that he faced death so that you could have life. So if you walk out with gratitude for nothing else this morning, let it be that. So let's continue. Let's continue our journey. And let's look at Mary. Let's look at Mary's life in chapter 12. John chapter 12, we're here to this middle part where Jesus uh, experiences something pretty special. Uh, the reason why I really wanted us to lay some groundwork with Lazarus this morning is because he is connected to Mary's story. And what I want you guys to know in here this morning is that we are all part of a bigger story. The person sitting next to you, you're part of their story. We are all connected to a bigger story, to Jesus' story, to the person next to you, to our families, to our community. So Mary was Lazarus' sister. She would have witnessed what Jesus came and did for him. And I can only imagine the thankfulness that would have existed in her heart. And in John chapter 12, we see that she does something pretty amazing. And I actually want to read it to you guys because it's only a couple verses. So if we can, I want us to just start in, uh, in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived. Now, I'm going to interrupt real quick. I know that um, you might be thinking, well, Jesus was already there. He just raised Lazarus from the dead, right? But the Bible tells us that after Jesus raised Lazarus, he actually retreated to a place called Ephraim, Ephraim, depending on how you want to say that. He spent some time there. He got away with his disciples, and he spent some time there. So he actually does leave Bethany and retreat for a little bit before he returns. And so what I want us to know is that when, what I want us to understand is this. When Jesus went to raise Lazarus, he understood that he was ending his ministry. He understood, I believe, that what was next for him was the cross. So he retreats for just a little bit with his disciples, and then he comes back. And I think when he comes back, he knows, okay, this is it. We're about to do what I came here to do. So, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus Liz lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor, and Martha served. Thank goodness for Martha's service. While Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of, perf of perfume. So Jesus comes back to Bethany. Lazarus has been raised from the dead, and guess who's sitting at the table in their home? It's Lazarus. Can you imagine that? Seeing this guy raised from the grave, and then you go to their house, and he's just sitting there. Like, hey. I'm alive. <laughs> that alone, just, I don't know, it makes me chuckle to think about. And Mary and Martha are there, and I can only imagine the thankfulness that they feel for all that Jesus has done for them. And they don't even know what Jesus is necessarily about to do, but they have so much thankfulness for what he's already done. And Mary, I think, guys, sometimes um, when I read this word, I think I can forget that the people in this were people. And that as I'm reading this to you, I'm not just reading you a, a, a cute story, but I'm reading you a moment in someone's life. A moment in Mary's life where she could look across the room and see at her kitchen table maybe, Lazarus, her brother who was dead, sitting there alive with Jesus, Jesus. And I think that as she's looking at that scene play out, she might have very well had a moment where she just said to herself, I got to do something. I got to show Jesus that I am thankful, that I love him. I got to do something. What can I do? 
And here's what she does. She goes and finds the most expensive thing she probably has. See, a pint of pure nard, it sounds like a small thing, but it was actually worth about a year's wages. So kids in the room, I know that when you hear the words year's wages, you're like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but your parents do, okay? Your parents know what that is. Think about working for a whole year and earning for a whole year and then giving all of that away. That's a lot, right? That was no small sacrifice on Mary's part. But because she was ready to express intentional gratitude, man, she just, she just does it. And I love that. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. We'll pick up in verse 4, and we'll stop at verse 11, okay? But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. And so the moment that Mary expresses this gratitude, she's already got people looking at her like she's crazy, right? She's already got people in the room going, what are you doing? Have you ever felt like when you praise Jesus, people who don't understand look at you and they're like, what is this? It's okay. I want to encourage you this morning. It's okay if your gratitude doesn't make sense to the people around you. It's okay. Jesus has given you so much to be thankful for. Express it. Even if people look at you like you're crazy. And she, I love this, because Jesus stands up for her. He says, leave her alone, <laughs> Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there, and they came not only because of him, but to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. So you guys can see, it is escalating, isn't it? There are people who are really, really um, not a fan of who Jesus says that he is. And it is, again, it's after this chapter that they begin not just to despise him, but to plot to kill him. So I have some, some thoughts about Mary's expression of gratitude this morning that I'd like for us to look at together, okay? And then um, I want us to look at what that could mean for us this morning. So three things, okay? Three things that I really think are special about Mary's expression of gratitude. The first one is this. Her expression began with an open-handed posture. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, those of you who were at our leadership um, training, there's several of you in this room that I recognize were there. Do you remember, Pastor Jeanette, she talked to us about what it means to live open-handedly, right? It means that I don't keep what I have, my treasures, my time, my resources uh, tucked away, and maybe if you ask for it, I can look through and see what I've got. But instead, it's this idea that I live with an open-handed posture. That anything I have, Jesus, you can use. Anything I have, it's here, and it's, it's for you, Jesus. I think that Mary's expression began with that posture. And I would challenge us today um, that the only way that her expression is this, the only way it happens, is if she starts here. I mean, think about it, guys. What causes a person to go and get the most expensive thing they own, something that, that is literally a year's worth of wages, and dump it on someone else's feet? Uh, just to say it out loud, it doesn't make any sense, right? But to Mary, it made sense. Because she, I believe she lived open-handedly. She lived open-handedly. And it caused her to look at everything she had as already belonging to Jesus. It was already his. And so her expression of gratitude was made possible by this posture of Jesus. All I have is yours. 
In addition to that, I think that Mary, she was willing to make an outrageously generous investment. She was willing to, her expression was an outrageously generous investment. It was no small thing. But here's the thing that I was thinking about as, as I looked over my notes last night. I was thinking about the fact that her, um, the perfume that she poured out on Jesus, it was a small thing, but it wasn't. It wasn't a small thing because it was very valuable and it was for her a huge investment. But when you think about um, the fact that it really was just like a jar or something of perfume, it really wasn't a lot in light of all that Jesus had done and was about to do. And Jesus reminded me that no matter how small or how large my gift, my gratitude might seem, that it's enough for him. Because I wonder if even though it was worth a year's wages, if Mary thought to herself, he deserves more. Because he does. So I would encourage us this morning, if you're sitting here and you feel like, well, I don't have a lot to give, that's enough. When you live open-handedly and say, Jesus, everything I have is yours, it doesn't matter what's in your hand, it's enough. So what Mary gave was no small investment. It was what she had. But because of her posture, because of the way she expressed gratitude to Jesus, it was enough. Something I want us to understand is that our investments, our investments that we make, whether that's our finances, whether that's our time, our efforts, maybe you serve here at this church, maybe you give to this church. I want you to know that your investment, no matter what it is, is connected to a bigger story. I love, I love when you read in John chapter 12 about what Mary did. I love that when Judas looks at her, or you know, looks at the room and says, um, well, why did you do this? This could have been sold and given to the poor, right? I love that Jesus stops him and goes, no, leave her alone. This was intended for my burial. And I wonder, you know, did Mary know that that was intended for his burial? Did she know that when she did it? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But what I love about that moment, those couple sentences in the word, is this. That whether Mary knew it or not, Jesus knew that what she was doing, the investment that she was making, Jesus knew that it was connected to the bigger story. And Jesus was willing to remind her, when you give, when you invest, when you pour yourself out, when you live open-handedly, you're connected to something. And maybe you see it, maybe you don't. You're connected to the bigger story. I love, now guys, the thing about the perfume that Mary anointed Jesus with is this. It smelled really, really strong, okay? <laughs> like when she pours the entire thing on him, I guarantee you people in the room are just like, what is she doing? <laughs> like, you just need a little bit of that. You just need a tiny bit. You don't need the whole thing. I love the thought that when Jesus was on the cross, he probably still smelled just like that perfume that Mary poured on it. She probably smelled of it too. It was meant to last, and she used a lot of it. So as he's hanging on, this, uh, on the cross, he smells of this act of gratitude that was poured out of him. You're connected to the bigger story. You might not see it, you might not understand it, but when you invest, Jesus is connecting you to himself and the people around you. If you, um, if you give of your time in this place, can I just say thank you? And I want you to know that as you serve here, you're making an investment that is bigger than you realize. There are lives just across the way in that, in that uh, sanctuary this morning who are being impacted in ways that I don't think we even really realize in this room. 
And if you've ever served with our children or our youth or really at any capacity, thank you. Your investment is connected to a bigger story. The last thing that I want us to note about what Mary did. is that um, she was intentional. Her expression was intentional. And I believe that when we live out gratitude intentionally, it's not just one moment, but it becomes a life of gratitude for what Jesus has done and what he's going to do. When we take a step, an intentional step towards gratitude, it changes us. I think sometimes when I think of expressing gratitude, I think of something that I do for other people. Well, I'm thankful, so I'm going to tell you. Or I'm thankful, so I'm going to show you. But I think what I've learned as I've looked at Mary's story is that intentional gratitude changes me. And I can only imagine the way that Mary's life was changed because she was willing to express just how thankful she was. Intentional gratitude changes us. All right. So what does this mean for us today? I have so loved looking at Mary's story with you guys. But what does this mean for us today? Why is intentional gratitude valuable for us? Well, I think it's for really the same three reasons. So, <laughs> so I want to share them with you again. First, I am invited, we are invited, to live with an open-handed posture that says, Jesus, everything I have is already yours. This is important because if we choose to live this way, when we have a moment where we can give, where we can invest, where we can express gratitude, we're going to be ready. This prepares us to do the kind of thing that when we live open-handedly, it prepares us for intentional acts of gratitude that change us, that are valuable. The second is this. I believe that every one of us in here are called to make an investment that is outrageously generous. And I can't tell you what that looks like, but I believe that we are called to an investment that is outrageously generous. Again, when we do that, it changes us. It doesn't just change the people around us, it changes us. And the last thing, and I want to invite our kids back up so they have time to get situated because they're going to lead us in one more song today. The last thing is this, God takes our intentional acts and he does multiplication. Now I know you might read that word and think, what? What I mean by that is this, when we choose to uh, to own one intentional act of gratitude, he will multiply it. Have you guys ever experienced um, something where you gave a little and Jesus turned it into a lot? Amen. Yeah? Where you gave what you had and you thought, I don't know what this is going to turn into, and then Jesus took it and just blew it up. <laughs> and he turned it into so much. And you look back and go, oh Lord, how did you do that? God takes our intentional acts and he does multiplication with it. And I want to also challenge us this morning that if we want to be a church, if we want to be a people who make disciples that make disciples that make disciples, let's start with one intentional act of gratitude for Jesus. Intentional, on purpose. And let's ask him, Jesus, continue it. Help me to live this every day. So guys, this morning, as we leave here, um, as we begin our, to, to end this, this morning, this time together, <laughs> I wanted to remind us of two things that we can do to begin to, sh to express in gratitude intentionally um, this week and in our lives. 
The first is this, and I know that as an action step, this seems uh, this seems not very ta tangible and practical, but I did this kind of on purpose. The first one is this, this morning after you go, I'd like for you to take some time this week and pray specifically and ask, God, am I living intentionally? Am I living intentionally? I think that this is an important question because what we've learned this morning is that when we do that, God is able to take an act that we might think is small and, and connect us to the bigger story. We can't afford to not live intentionally. And the second thing, and this one is incredibly practical, as you leave here this morning. If you're, if you're sitting where you're at and you're thinking, man, I, I want to do something now to give, to invest, even if it's something small. I want to practice living open-handedly, even if it's just something quick that I can do right now. We've moved into our sanctuary, or into our gym, they're normally right outside our sanctuary, our giving tree and our outreach house station. When you turn around, you'll see both of those things. We've placed them there intentionally because we believe that when we make a generous investment, that Jesus can do with it things that we would have never imagined. Our giving tree goes to bless our Snyder Park Elementary and our Edgerton families this season. I would love for us to invest in that because I believe that God will take that investment and multiply.